I invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to Titus, the third chapter, or Titus, no, or third lesson, where we're going into chapter two of Titus. It's good to see everyone here this, this morning. <clears throat> One of the things we saw last week at the close <clears throat> was how these verses we're about to study, how they relate to doctrine. People sometimes say, well, I'd like to have a relationship with Christ, and that's fine, but we don't want any doctrine. Uh, doctrine seems to be a negative thing, but I want you to notice how closely living the life of a Christian is connected with doctrine. And on the surface, you think, if you don't have a prejudice about doctrine, and that means differences, and that means debate, and that means uh, conflict, if you don't think about that, you'll think about, well, it's just teaching. Then it makes sense what we're about to see. But speak thou the things which befit sound doctrine, aged men, how should they be living? Aged women, how should they be living? Young men, young women who become wives, how should they be living? Well, the, the older women will teach, that's doctrine, will be teaching them. What about the younger men? What about you, Titus? What a, an example you're going to be. What about the slaves? That indeed in this time of the, of the world, and slavery was so common among the world, they were becoming Christians. How does a slave uh, react? That's doctrine. That's teaching. In fact, when you see love, the idea of loving one another, what is that? It's doctrine. It's teaching. So I don't want us to be adverse against the idea of, of doctrine, but sound, healthy doctrine is necessary. It is essential in how we're going to live our life as a Christian. Otherwise, we just live like we want to. We'll put a little bit of worship here. We'll put a little bit of honor there. We'll honor God. I believe God exists, and we won't get too much in the details. Well, in our Bible study, we get into the details because that's exactly the mind of God being revealed to us, as we see in, in 1 Corinthians, that he's speaking to us. So we want to see, he, he, of course, the Koine Greek was the language of the, of the world at that time, and so the Bible was written at that particular time in that language. But we have our translations. We have a lot of translations that we can get at the word. And so that's what we're going to be involved in this work this morning. And if you've uh, filled out your questions, you know that's been the journey you've been on. And we'll try to clarify some things if, uh, if that becomes a, a difficulty thing for us. But question number one we answered last time, and it's the sense of daily living, marriage, and how, how uh, a woman was to be thinking about her, her family. And we'll put ourselves back into that culture to help us understand it, and we'll come out of that. We don't have slavery today, but we can, we can learn some principles. It's interesting that the same word that we'll look at for slaves is the same word that wives are to have. Slavery, wives, you may feel like that if you're a wife and a mother and all the things you do for the man, but uh, the, the terms are similar. They're back to the same terms. So we got to understand what does that mean? Am I a slave? Has the relationship and marriage always been slavery? Never has been. Paul argued that. You're not under bondage in such case. You're not a slave to your husband or wife. If they're an unbeliever, you let them go if they want to go because you're a Christian. That's 1 Corinthians 7. So there's these, these, these terms that we need to kind of have a working understanding. That's the purpose of uh, me being here to help uh, get to that, that point. So let's look at question number two. What characteristics make the older Christian man a dignified? Some of your versions already have it. They already translated that word into our language. So it's dignified. That's a dignified older gentleman. What makes that up? Well, he just dresses nice. Uh, it's deeper than that. We're looking at their, their character. So what do you see there that makes uh, that older man, if he's going to follow the doctrine of Christ, what, what is there that says that indeed he, he's dignified? And you might make a combination of all of them, but there was one word that stands out. And we said, well, that, what comes after temperate in your Bible? You see the word dignified in some of your translations? I, I, I've looked at them, I know. But mine says grave. Oh, that's not dignity. That's a, that's a dull person. 
he's, he's, uh, he's not very uplifting and grave. But what does that mean? It follows the idea of temperate, being of sound mind, vigilant, uh, looking around them, understanding what's going on. The brain, the mind is, is in, involved in, in vigilance, so he's temperate. There's a self-control that's involved in, in the things that he's thinking. Well, that can make a dignified person as well. But he specifies the idea of grave. Then he says sober-minded. And, and what we're going to be looking at being sound in. But just look at that word grave or dignified. What is it in that word that says that's a dignified gentleman? It's not his dress. Well, maybe we'll have your subjective view on it. We'll get there. <laughs> what do you usually think about uh, uh, dignified? Well, what would be grave? He's serious. He's serious. Not that he doesn't, uh, you know, chuckle <laughs> and have fun in life. But he's serious. He's, he's, he's not flippant. He's, he's, he's not, uh, he's, got, he, he's got the ability of, of living life and being serious about life. He has the dignity because he knows how to behave himself in certain situations. Uh, there's dignity about him. Uh, and all of these things about the idea of, of being temperate, we always say, well, he doesn't drink. Well, temperate means of, of having a vigilant mind, a sound mind. He goes with sober thinking as, he, uh, as we continue in these particular uh, specific definitions. There, there's a sense of he's, he's not just silly. He's a dignified man. There's some seriousness about the person. And they may have a good sense of humor. They, they may uh, laugh, and they should. But he's just not silly about things. Life is serious enough, he's lived it, and he lives it with vigilance in his, in his mind. His mind is clear of what's important in life. He has a sober, so there's, there's, there is a sense of, of, of being uh, self-controlled. And sometimes the word self-controlled is there with temperate. And then the sound, the sound mind, or the idea of, of being, being sober-minded, that goes along with seriousness. That goes along with being grave. So it's the idea of, of being serious about things that uh, uh, that becomes a part that it's just not, life is just a joy and silly. It'd just be silly. That's the, what we're trying to avoid. Yes. Yes, and that, that would go along with the, the mind, being sensible about things. But there's a good one just for that as, as being, being grave, as seriousness, sensible. And we, we see a lot of the, of the, of the proverbs that, that we come across and realize how sensible in situations. This last week just, just looked at the idea of how, how, much, how much of an uplifting of the heart is good news, especially from afar. And so it's the idea of just giving good news. It's a cheerful heart. It's good medicine. And yet at the same time, when you sing a song to a heavy heart, it's like taking a coat off when you're cold. It's like mixing vinegar with soda. It just exasperates people. Well, I thought I needed, they needed cheering up. A man of dignity knows when to cheer up and when he needs to keep his mouth shut. Maybe when he needs to leave uh, a hospital room. Uh, I'm here to cheer you up. And, then, and it's not the day for that. You live long enough and realize you care about people. You try to take that in consideration. You know, you know there's... there's a way of living. They're sensible, being sensible. When a person's throwing up all night, and that was my schedule to come in to see you in the hospital, and I'm here to give you good news and cheer you up. And they're just throwing up every five minutes. They don't want you there. You can come back another day. Well, who learned that? Well, the Proverbs teaches you, you better know that. You better know how to answer a fool according to his knowledge and when not to answer a fool according to his folly. There's times to speak. There's times to be silent. Who learns that? A man that's serious, a man that's sensible, a man that is striving to live life as a godly person, you learn that all of a sudden there's some dignity about that person. They're just not going around making people cheerful and, and, and silly things and telling jokes and, uh, when people are not in the mood for that. And that's life. Yes, somebody had their hand over here.
Yeah. But I'm laying down, every time you're reading the Proverbs, that's a cheerful heart, it's good medicine, and you need to cheer them up. So there's, there's a time to know the difference in it. Uh, and and the, the idea that you would think about that, that's being serious. That's being sensible. That's, uh, that's a dignified man of, of his, his approach to, to things in life. Question number three. In what important three areas must the older man be sound in? His body may not be sound. That's deteriorating in, in all of us. But there are three areas where he needs to be sound. And so what is it? Sound in what? Sound in faith. And what are two other things that go along with that? Healthy or sound and, and love. And then what? He's in it for the long haul. Sound in patience or endurance. So we talk about a lot of sound in faith and being being healthy in faith. Well, we know that faith has to produce works or it's dead. That's not sound. So there's a sound faith. He's putting into practice the things that he believes in from, from God's word. And that's part of, of that life. What about being, being sound in love? What can you do with love sometime? God says to Christians that, that we are to be fervent and and, and love and not being hypocritical about it. Be, be fervent in, in love that's without guile. You can say I love you and you don't mean it. Your actions show you don't. And so I've gotta be sound in, in my love. I'm seeking the well-being of another and I really mean that and I'm gonna live that way and then sound in, in patience because if we're not enduring, the life of a Christian is not a 100 yard sprint it's a marathon. It's living your whole life. But at the end, you're, you're striving to just to be as strong as you were before. And that's sound and endurance. So when you have faith and love, what made you endure that made it sound? You had what? You got faith and love. What will be the third thing? Hope. Hope. Does that make you endure? And I think that's going to be involved in endurance and patience. I have hope. There's something greater than what I'm going through here. Even, and this is part of growing older and being old. And so if you got those three areas, faith, love, and a hope that bolsters up and gives soundness of faith to, uh, to endurance, what are we enduring for? And if you're not, if you don't have that hope set on heaven, you might turn your way, turn your back upon Christ because it's not an easy road uh, to, to travel. It's not an easy road to plow. It's not, a, it's not something that just uh, uh, doesn't take effort. It does take effort, but it's worthwhile. What did Paul say at the end of his course? I finished the course. I've kept the faith. That's how you, that's how you be strong in, in faith. Henceforth, there's later for me a crown of righteousness, which... That's just not for him only, but all those that love, love with sound, who love is appearing. That, what are we supposed to love God with? All our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Got to keep it sound. Got to keep it healthy. So I see faith, hope, and love there. And that hope is going to be helping the, uh, to be healthy in endurance. Because if we lose our hope, we have an ex example of that. When people thought there was no resurrection, it was a calamity to their faith. It overthrew their faith. That wasn't faith, what, and they're not going to endure. What did Demas do? I love this present world. He, he stopped his being faithful. He loved the present world. So all of those things have to be sound. And it's interesting to me, he's not speaking to a young man here. He's speaking to older men. It is critical that that stays real sound as we get closer and closer to our walk on this time on earth. All right, any questions or comments? Yes, Erica? That's a good, that's a good point. 
And, and as we said earlier, you could put all those and say, well, that's, that person's dignified. They'd all work there. But it's interesting, if they're all there, you, there's no doubt about it. You know, it all working together. And that, that grave or that dignified character comes, comes out as well. All right, question number four. What specifically is being overthrown? Well, that was uh, from last question, okay. Uh, we'll go to five. Well, I could say, let's answer that because that came from another outline from earlier on. But is there something in verse 11 that is overthrown? Is there anything in verse 11 that's overthrown in Titus 1? That's where the question came from. They were overthrowing whole houses uh, with that. So we're in, we're in another lesson here. And that was left over from that. So let's just review, okay? What was overthrown back there with the false teaching? People's houses, the families, the, the, these people who were lying and so forth, and they do it for money. They overthrow whole houses, teach you things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, for money's sake. And so that's where that question came from. It just got on the next outline as well. I typed one too many. All right? And I think you have, the, you have the corrected copy. You don't have number four. So why would the older women especially need the instructions to not be slanders or addicted to much wine? What does he say? He says that to older women. We've got to put ourselves back in those times because we sure don't want to make you mad this morning if you're a woman and of age. This is what we think of you? No, it's not the way it was supposed to be. But why was this? Older men didn't get that. Well, it's because, you know, Paul's against women. That's arguments have been made. David? Okay. Okay. True. But, and I, that's, and I think that's, a, that's the best one I can come up with, too. But I think about, well, they uh, had a lot of time on their hands. Uh, did they have washing machines? Did they have dishwashers? Electric dishwasher? Just throw them in there, take care of that. I got extra time. Uh, I think some of us lived through, I know my, my dad's lived through times where, what was wash day? It was Monday? All day long. <laughs> Maybe another day was for ironing, but you, you, you took all day to wash your clothes. And we talk about people back in those days, they had Lyon, Fuller, you know, they, you know they were rubbing things together to get things clean. What time did they have on their hands? But I think it is true. That's why the older women who may not, you know, they've passed doing that type of work. Maybe they cannot. They got time on their hands. And we see from the other epistles that we can become busybodies meddling in matters that are not our own. When we have time on our hands, what do we say? What is the devil's workshop? Where does he work? Idle hands. And it's interesting that these two things, one is the, what does slandering mean? What are we doing when we slander someone? You're speaking evil about them, you're telling lies. You're, you're accusing them of something, and most of the time it's not true. Where do we, we get our word devil? And the word that is translated here was uh, diabolos. What does that mean? Diabolical. It's the idea of the devil. And that's what the devil has done. From the very beginning, the devil accused God to the first man and woman. Accused him. Oh, the reason you are not to have that fruit that he says you can't have is because he knows you'll be like him. That's accusing something that's false about God to the people. And then they'll accuse Job to God. God, you know, you've given him everything in the world. You take that away from him, he'll curse you to your face. That's not true. But it was accusations. That's, what the, that's how the devil works. And that's why it's so bad about blasphemy and, and, and to say things about people. They may not even be there. 
but you twist things to make it look bad because you're after them and you slander them. So here comes your enemies. Here comes time on your hands. You don't like certain things, so you have time to twist things and accuse them. And then what's the second thing that's happening? Maybe, as David says, they have a lot of time on their hands. What happens? They could be indulging in much wine because it took much wine of that case, on that time to get drunk. But they were enslaved to it. Can you be enslaved to a little wine? To a little wine? <laughs> yes, you can have it every day. You can have it every other hour. You can have it at 10, 2, and 4 like you do your Dr. Peppers in the old days. You, you can be addicted to it. And so we get, well, that, you can drink a little bit of wine. No, it's being enslaved to that where that would affect your thinking and your senses. It would dull your senses and maybe you don't feel so bad about nailing that lady on the other field over there because you're, they're enemies. And these were older women. I think it's sensible to think about them having more time on their hands because we'll look at the younger women there to be workers and they're active and some so the idea of just becoming older our bodies can't not do what they used to do and so i think that's a sensible point i don't know of any other other than these were some bad old women on the island of crete they were the, you better watch them but he's trying to help them that uh, and indeed they're supposed to receive instructions uh in, in, in a character that they are to have no, notice what he says that i'll get i'll get to you uh they must be reverent in demeanor. That must be respectable. Reverent means I reverence a holy God. Therefore, my holiness in life is, is that's going to be my demeanor, demeanor. I'm separating myself from the world of sin, reverencing God. So I'm living a holy, maybe a chaste life is involved in that. And so I'm, I'm living that type of reverence, not in satisfying my flesh and my I get mad at somebody so I slander them and I'm enslaved to to much wine older women there's there's a contrast there someone had their hand up yes Marilyn yeah to make you feel better that's a tendency we have. If we can tear the whole world down, then I don't look so bad. And I don't feel so bad that I'm not living up to what I want to live up to. And they can drive you to drink. That's, that's, that, that comes along with it too, that you, you, you try to drown your sorrows. You try, to, you try to medicate yourself, those things. So those things are they're very much of a connection there. The tendency that we have. Being, living a godly life takes discipline it takes a desire and, and we all fall in these traps we can be diabolical every child of god can be and we've got to work on that so what is he doing he's teaching these women and apparently this was a particular problem there and so we want the older women to have a, to to be reverent in their demeanor and we want them to be teachers what are they supposed to be involved in, in, in teaching? What good should older women do? What's, what's the good? Richard? Okay. And when they do that, they're teachers of that which is good, isn't it? There, there are two Greek words, all through the New Testament, and you can always... Yeah, context will help you distinguish them, but sometimes it's good to distinguish them uh, what what the the writer has in his mind. There's there's that which is good in its character, and that's the emphasis. It's good, holy, uh, the quality. It's it's good in its being, and then there's a word that emphasizes not just the beauty in its being, but it is effectual. It is good in its, in its effects. What it affects is good, and that is benefiting someone else. 
And you can see it all through the New Testament. Sometimes they're, they're putting it together. That we are to test all things and hold to that which is good. Well, when I test it by God's word, what I'm holding to is that which in its inherent nature is good. Good in its quality. In the same 1 Thessalonians 5th chapter, don't render anyone evil for evil, but render unto them good. You be a benefit to them. Yes, it's going to be good in its character, but that particular word is emphasizing it is a good in its benefit. It's, it, help, it, it does something good to the person. And you didn't render evil for evil, but you, you, for, with evil you rendered good. Overcome evil with good. And so it's, it's good in its benefit. What do you think this word? Teach that which is good. The word here is denoting that which is good in its character. And what that is, is helping wives, the younger women, to be, as Richard says, good wives. As, as being a benefit that will be helpful to their family. But he uses the word here, he doesn't use the word for benefit. It first of all, is that the truth? Is that the quality of that which is good? And when you teach that which is good, here's what you're going to be teaching. That they may train their young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sober-minded, chaste, workers at home, kind, be in subjection to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. That's good in effect when you put those things into practice. But the whole body of teaching, it's all good. It's all good. And so... Older women should be teaching the younger women here. And, well, I didn't think women could teach. They're not to teach over a man. I mean, they can't instruct a man what to do to be saved, but to have that, that authority over them and to teach them. That, that's, that's the limitation. But they, Proverbs speaks about teaching the children. We teach them. Here's a great example. Yeah, they're going to be teachers. They can bring experience of living godly lives. They can then teach the younger women. But here it was, it was the idea of training them and training them to uh, be the kind of wives. It, it may be strange for us to see what they're talking about. So our next question is, why would young married women, just, just why would they need to be trained to love their own husband? To own their own husbands and their children. Isn't there something called natural affection? Why would you have to be trained to do that? I think we're put, you're putting yourself back in that culture and you've got to do that. Arranged marriages would be such that, that, that would cause this problem. And the very word that he uses here, how many times do we see, it, you, you hear enough about love. And love is agapeo love. You ever heard that? Agapeo? That's the Greek word that's translated love in our Bibles, and that's true. And that is a love that has value, that sees value in others. That's why he says you can love your enemy. You don't like them. They're treating you badly. But loving your enemy, they are made in the image of God, and I value them as a human being. I will love my enemy and I will pray for them, and I'll do them good. That's, that's, that's a command of God. That's doctrine. That's going to how you treat other people. But that's value. You love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. I value him. Husbands, love your wives. Agapeo. I got to love my wife. I seek her well-being because I value her. It's all about value. That's not the word here. It's the word phileo. It's a great, I mean, it's not a great example in our time, but what does the city of Philadelphia tell you? Phileo Delphia. Love of brothers. Try to play football there and see how much they love you. That's the booingest place in the world. That's a tough place to be, be a professional sports person. Not not much love there in that sense. But that's the name of the work, of, of, of the city. We, we had a, in the Bible, we have, we have a city in Philadelphia and Asia Minor. But that's phileo. So if it's not a matter of value, phileo is brothers. 
it is a it is a sense of belonging for brothers Philadelphia I be, we belong to one another back to your point if you had arranged marriages if you had backgrounds of, of polygamy that's why the proverb speaks about there you know a friend sticks it closer to you than a brother what if you got same father but you got different mothers there was there could be a lot of, of, of problems between the siblings even in a and one that just has one the one mother or both but a lot, a lot of times that added to the problems of, of why a better friend would be closer to you than a brother but these were sometimes arranged marriages in that culture and you've been you're going to marry him you, we, we decided that when you're five years old you don't love him you're not attracted to him so what and in that culture he said well we'll make the best of it so what are the, what are the older women doing i'm going to train you and you're going to be exercised you're going to be disciplined with the word of god that you create a home that has a sense of belonging i belong to that man and these children belong to me and we belong to each other there was the importance of of the family it's phileo love and to me, it wasn't, we said, well, I love them. You get attracted to someone. We, we get attracted to someone, we marry them. And we fall into love. It, well, there's, there's our emotions in that. Some, some of these girls and boys, they, they was arranged. And they didn't have that attraction to one another. But they had to learn in that, in that relationship that... Uh, we we're going to belong to one another this is what we're having and we're going to we're going to develop that in our home yes sir. That's right, and, and societies crumble when that's not there. And, and that's the elephant in the room, so to speak. That's what politicians, people like that, they, under, they may know it and all that, but that's not going to be public policy because that's got God in it. And they're not going to look at that, that that way. It's a problem with guns. <laughs> it's not a problem with a broken home and so forth. And so it's just sad to see a culture of that, but the point is we, we can... We, we got to work on our families, but we can be an influence to the world about us of how to, to uh, have a healthy family, sense of belonging. Thank you. And then also how that will help our culture, help our government, help, uh, especially we live in a republic where we have to self-govern. We have to be moral people. As they said, moral and religious, our founding fathers said. But there you uncover the point of, of, of what what is happening in our culture of was how I want to satisfy myself and the children are the ones that are uh, that are left to their own and that's bad but we put a godliness there we'll find well they belong to me I'm going to, I'm going to train them and they're, they're going to exercise that but they first of all needed a sense of belonging so we can learn from that you, we, we may be in, infatuated with someone over time our home has to be well we belong to one another and there's a sense of that a lot of times children were offered up as sacrifices in their culture. Where's your natural affection that needs to be there? They, they had to be trained. They belong to me. I, I care for them. And what we think is strange, it was a problem. And that's where the older women could stand in and help them. Does the command to be workers at home suggest that you, you should not work away from home? The Bible says that 
They are to be workers at home. In what sense are we talking about? Does that mean you cannot go out and get a, and get a job? Of course, COVID has made this easier, hasn't it? You can go get a job and you can work where? You'd be at home. And that may be the way it's going to be from now on. And you may like it that way. And a lot of women are going to be able to maybe keep a job because they can, they can do that. Uh, we'll see how things, things change. But what is the concept, workers at home? And I, I think about Proverbs 31. I know that, David, go ahead. And all of those activities were focused upon the home, wasn't it? I'm helping the home. So sometimes younger people get married and the finances are difficult and she can help the home. And when the kids come along, say, I like to stay at home. And you try to do that. And sometimes you work your things around so you can be home when the kids come home from school. All that's focused on, it's not my career and I, I care about that and, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, I'm, I'm okay because, like Proverbs, she bought a field. She had merchandise that she sold and saw as profitable and all of those things. But the focus is to be, I'm a worker at home. My work and my activity is centered in making my home a place that we belong to one another, we care for one another, and, and be truly uh, a help to ones. And not that they couldn't work away from the, from the house. And a lot of times that's been interpreted that way, and I think a wrongly so. So, but that activity is there. So wonder if, this is where the husband can come to play, but wonder if, if she's working at a job and having to work all these hours and the husband is not able to provide unless she does that, does he not do any work at home like sweeping or mopping or cleaning or maybe cooking a dinner for her that night? Because we learned how to do that. we just bad cooks. She doesn't want that. Uh, but there's things you can help. Well, that's woman's work. Kicking in third gear on a, on a lazy boy and getting my dinner. But she's been working all day, too. So you work together and, and trying to, uh, we belong. But uh, she may have to work out away from the house in order to be paying attention to things at home. And she's got to realize that that's my primary responsibility. I'm going to get it done. But we can help. Husbands can help. So that's another, another thing. What does being a bottom be in subjection to your own husband? What does the word subjection mean? Literally, it means to bring myself under the authority that God has given my husband to be. If that's, that's the way God arranged it, so we're okay with that. And what does it mean in practicality? You don't want to answer that, it's time to quit. You don't want to. It, it, it's idea of subjection means, means to obey. And that's, that's something to think about all week in it. Obey. Uh, but that's what it literally means. But we want to talk about, and what's, you know, Paul said, obey in subjection in everything. Let's see how that can work in a practicality. And we'll have to, we have to stop. And we'll do that next week. Thank you. Lord willing.